Hey guys, welcome to episode two of That Philly John. I'm your host today, joined by Jay Clark and Brian McLernan. So let's first start off with the Eagles, who are now 8-1. and one. Guys, were you satisfied with how the Eagles played against the Cowboys? Uh, I would have to say no. Um, I wasn't really a huge fan of how the secondary played in that game. If I were to define the biggest problem for them, it would be that secondary. They just didn't look too good. None of, none of the guys, like even our stars like Slayer Bradbury, played all that well. And uh, they gave the, the Cowboys way too many chances toward the end of that game with their penalties that uh, gave the Cowboys a lot of chances. I mean, obviously they, they didn't come through with it, but they just had way too many chances, and uh, it, you just can't do that against a talented Cowboys team. Yeah, but the secondary, Ryan, was really beat up, and I think that there was even a drive and towards the end of that game where Slay and Bradbury weren't on the field. And I think that Sean, Desc- Sean Desai was kind of working with scraps, and I think that being banged up so much on defense and still being able to walk away with a W against a division rival in the Dallas Cowboys, and whether you want to, what are the, whether you want to believe it or not, they're a good football team, and you beat a good football team while you were banged up, and I think that it was a good win for the Eagles to come out there and go into the bye week with a little bit of a taste of victory. I mean, yeah, and the bye week probably couldn't have come at a better time. It's just, I mean, that'll definitely give them a chance to heal up a bit more, but I just wish that uh, we got to see a couple times guys like Slay and Bradbury step up a little bit. Slay didn't really do that great of a job against Brandon Cooks, uh, and overall I just... Um, uh, I didn't really like the secondary play in the game from what we did see. I mean, the pass rush definitely came through in the long run toward the end with those sacks, especially from Reddick. But um, I just, I can't really say I was fully satisfied, but hopefully they can uh, satisfy me against the Chiefs. Yeah, I don't know that I was fully satisfied, but I do think that they, they stepped up and they beat a good football team while they were banged up. And I think that that is something that is very very, very encouraging to see. We're starting to play better football as the year goes on, and that's what you want to see if you're a Philadelphia Eagles fan. And who do you guys think is the scariest team in the NFC that could possibly dethrone the Eagles as the number one seed? Uh, For me, I'm going to have to go with the 49ers. Um, Whether people want to believe that or not, I think that the 49ers are a very well-together put football team, and they have a good system under Kyle Shanahan, and that's really what's carried them to success. They have a great defense, and they have a great system. Brock Purdy is not special by any means, but you look at guys like Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, George Kittle, and Brandon Ayuk, those guys are special on the offensive end. They have a good line, and they have a great defense to back that up on all three levels from the defensive line of the linebackers and in the secondary. The the 49ers are a team that scares me as being the number two seed that's hanging around in the NFC. Yeah, and I would actually want to take a look at the Detroit Lions. I mean, they I would say they, what, they have the second best record in the NFC right now at seven and three. Uh, they've, their offense has looked very strong. I like Jared Goff, most of his play this year. Uh, David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs being a good one-two punch in the backfield. They have talented wide receivers. Amon Ross St. Brown doing very well. They have a very good offense. They have a lot of talented players on that defense, starting with Aiden Hutchinson. I mean, they're just a very good football team. They have a cakewalk schedule to end the year. I mean, they, they play the Bears twice. I think they only play one or two teams that have a winning record overall. I believe one of them is the Cowboys, but overall a cakewalk schedule should definitely lead them to one of the top four seats. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the Lions, Brian, and I think that they are, um, they're a good team, but they don't have the sustained, the sustained success that the 49ers have where they proved it last year, making it to the NFC Championship, where they were ultimately knocked out by the Eagles. And does Jalen Hurts still have a chance at MVP? Uh, I would say yes, and it's because nobody else has really shown out or shown up this season. Patrick Mahomes is having a down year. Josh Allen and the Bills are statistically, on paper, they're a 5-5 five and five team. They are mediocre. Uh, Joe Burrow um, hasn't played up to par at the beginning of the season for the Bengals, so I think that Jalen Hurts absolutely does have a chance if he can stop turning the ball over as much as he is. You look at Lamar Jackson, he's a guy that turns the ball over a lot and is one of the guys that's in the MVP race, so I think that the turnovers aren't as much of a factor this year as they would be in other years, and I think that Jalen Hurts does have what it takes to be the MVP in this league. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree, Jake. I mean, overall, Jalen Hurts very recently is having a lot of good stints. I mean, we saw what he did against Washington. We saw what he did against Dallas. I mean, obviously not as flashy, 207 passing yards, two passing TDs, and a rushing score. Very good to see from him. Just very recently, he seems to be stepping up. He didn't get off to a very good start uh, having a lot of those turnovers. He led the league in interceptions for a bit, but now he's kind of started to heat up. 
show what he's worth. And uh, overall, I think he's looked very clean, especially comparing him to other QBs in the NFC and AFC. So moving on to the Sixers now, is losing back-to-back -back games, home games, after an eight-game winning streak concerning for the Sixers? Uh, I wouldn't say it's concerning. I'd say it's frustrating. It's November. You're not supposed to be playing your best basketball this early in the season. Uh, but it is frustrating. You played the Pacers in back-to-back -back games, and you beat them in the first game when it was just a regular, you know, normal – it wasn't an in-season tournament game. You lost the in-season tournament game. And then you lose to the Celtics, who don't have Jalen Brown or Kristaps Porzingis. I just think that's a frustrating loss. You can't let guys like Al Horford and Derek White be the ones to beat you. And I just think that nobody really stepped up for the Sixers in that game, which was very frustrating to see. But to answer the question, it's not a concern. It's still very early, and the Sixers have been good to this point. I mean, when you say that, Jake, I can't really say that it makes sense to expect someone like Joel Embiid or Tyrese Maxey to get 30 or 40 points every single game. I just don't see that uh, as a very realistic possibility. I mean, it, it's very possible, but I just don't see it as a realistic way of thinking. But uh, yeah, I, I will say it does stink to lose those back-to-back -back games, but uh, I will say it's still very early on in the season. We still got a lot of games left to be played, still a lot of things to do. Celtics, still a really strong team. And they just had that next man up mentality when it came to losing some of those healthy players. And I just, I don't think there's really anything to panic about. Yeah, we got to stay positive and hopefully get another win. Um, moving on, who and what is the biggest asset for the Sixers out of the James Harden deal? Well, I just think that it's got to be the first round picks. I think that using those to package them to get a guy like Zach Levine, who I think will be a great third option for this team, especially with the absence of Kelly Oubre. I think that Zach Levine is a guy who puts up over 20 points a game this year, and he can create off the ball, which I think is really important because you have a guy like Tyrese Maxey and Joel Embiid that almost need the ball to touch the ball almost every single possession. And I like that Zach Levine is a guy that doesn't really need the ball to create with a, he can create without dribbling, and I think that that's super impressive, and he's a pretty solid defender. I think that those first-round picks can be packaged to trade for a guy like Zach Levine, who's better than anybody you got in return from James Harden. Yeah, I will agree, but uh, I like Nick Batum. He's my guy. He's a great fifth option to have, especially with the unfortunate injury to Kelly Oubre that'll sideline him for a couple weeks. I think he's a guy that you can rely on in that fifth spot, either him or Covington. And I just, I, I like the way Batum plays. I mean, we haven't seen too much action from him, a little small sample size, but I think as the weeks go on, we'll see a bit more from him. And I think overall, I think he'll be a solid fifth option for the Sixers. Brian, I just have a quick question. Shoot. What number is greater, 21.7 or 5.1? Just what number is greater? <laughs> I don't think I have to answer that question. I think 21.7 is greater. Zach Levine's a guy that's going to score the basketball. Nick Batum is a solid guy to maybe come off the bench, but... As your fifth starter, I think that you could look a lot better if you have a guy like Tobias Harris or DeAnthony Melton out there as your fifth starter and not somebody like Nick Batum. I think Nick but Batum, I'd... I think he'd be a good bench piece, but I just think that Zach Levine would be a lot better suited for this lineup and those first round picks are much more of an asset to trade for a guy like yeah. Zach Levine. But I just, I wanted, I'm trying to focus on the players that we have now and not the players that we could hypothetically get because we might not get Zach Levine at all. So. I just wanted to focus on the people that we have right meow. And is Tyrese Maxey on pace to be an all-NBA player? I would say yeah. I mean, he's had that offensive consistency that he has shown throughout this season. I mean, we saw that 50-point game that uh, Rob Strauss was able to PA <laughs> announce for, which is our guy here in the studio. But um, yeah, Tyrese Maxey, he's, he's been that guy. He's been terrific all season long. And I like the offensive consistency he's had. He's overall shown himself to be a very talented player. He has stepped up as that number two option here for the Sixers so far this year. And hopefully he can keep that offensive consistency going into the All-Star break and hopefully into the playoffs. I just need to see more, Brian. It's been 11 games, and he's on a great pace. And I think that the question says it on pace. And I think that while he is on pace, I need to see more. Because you can have a short stint where you go off for a couple games and then come back down to earth. I need to see more sustained success from Tyrese Maxey. I just think it's too soon right now. I hope that he becomes the all-NBA player that 
the Sixers need him to be, but right now it's just too soon for me. Jake, you know what this reminds me of? It kind of reminds me of that A.J. Brown question we talked about two weeks ago, except opposite answers. It is, op- it is opposite answers. I think that A.J. Brown's already shown enough because of the dominance that he's had, and it's, a, it's been about half a season for A.J. Brown. For Tyrese Maxey, it's been 11 games. It's not even a quarter of the season yet, so I just think that we need to see more but I think, from him around the All-Star break. But we've also seen Tyrese Maxey here for a couple of years instead of A.J. Brown's one and a half. So I think, I think overall he is showing to be on pace for that, and uh, I, just like the, I just love him. I'm just saying maybe Rob Strauss is the lucky. Maybe he needs to announce a few more games to get uh, Maxi. Get him in there. I'm just saying. So now moving on to the Flyers, does Carter Hart have, or coming back, make them a legit contender? Um, I would say yes. I, say, I would say that because the goaltending position is super important when it comes to hockey, and he is one of the better goaltenders in the NHL. And I think that the impact that Carter Hart makes when he's out there on the ice is much greater for the Flyers than when it, it is without him. I think that he's such an impact guy in net, and I, he really makes this team 10 times better when he's out there on the ice. So I think for that reason, I think he makes them a bit more of a legit playoff contender. I'm going to agree, Jake. He just makes this team overall just a better NHL squad. I mean, without him, it's it feel like I feel like some sort of leadership is lost a little bit. I just think overall he is just... He is the guy on the Flyers. I mean, a 921 save percentage already this year in nine games played. I mean, overall career, 89 wins. I mean, you can't go wrong with a guy like that in net. I mean, he is, he is the guy in Philadelphia for the Flyers. And can Bobby Brink win Rookie of the Year? Uh, I would have to say no because of a, a guy named Connor Bedard. Um, Connor Bedard is the, a generational hockey talent, and I just think that there's no way that unless Connor Bedard gets hurt that Bobby Brink can win the Rookie of the Year. Now, I do think that Bobby Brink could end up being a finalist for this award, but I don't see him being better than Connor Bedard, who's a generational, once-in-a-generation once gener- once talent. Yeah, I'm going to agree, Jake. I mean, I don't think we've had enough of a sample size to really show that he can really get there. I mean, the Flyers have... A lot of a lot of talent on this squad. Steve, uh, Konechny, uh Owen Tippett. I mean, you can name a bunch of guys, and I, they've pretty much overshadowed uh, him so far to the point where I just don't think he can collect enough stats to really prove that he could really get there and obviously overshadow Connor Bedard. And let's finally discuss the game and the win against the Hurricanes. Yeah, I think that was a great game for the Flyers. They uh, were going up against the back-to-back Metro Division champs in the Hurricanes, a very good team, a team in the Hurricanes. And the stat that I like to look at for when we're looking at the Hurricanes is the Hurricanes are ninth in the power play, 17th in the penalty kill. The Flyers are 31st in the power play and 14th in the penalty kill. And I think that that shows you a big a big gap between those two teams and the fact that the Flyers were able to go out and compete against a team like that and end up winning is a huge, huge boost of confidence for a group of young guys that's just trying to go out and do something special. Yeah, I mean, we saw a group of guys step up, Owen Tippett, Travis Konechny, and Ryan Poling all scoring in that game. I mean, that's the type of win that can build some momentum. I mean, that puts you second in the wild card. And overall, it's just a great win against a really talented Hurricane squad. It puts you at 8-7-1 and one on the year. And that just it just puts you in a really good spot, and that's definitely a momentum booster for the Flyers. Yeah, I believe Owen Tippett had his 100th career point, which is uh, pretty impressive and cool to see. Good for Owen Tippett, man. I love him. <laughs> and they also went 4-1 on the West Coast road trip, which is a great thing for the Flyers. And now moving on to the Phillies. Um, who do Nola and Hoskins sign with if they do not return to the Phillies? Um, I think that Aaron Nola is going to end up out on the West Coast with the San Francisco Giants. He doesn't have to deal with Gabe Kapler anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a hitter-friendly ballpark, uh, excuse me, a pitcher-friendly ballpark out there in uh, San Francisco. And I just think that the, um, the, the Giants had a bit of a down year last year, and I think that they're looking to spend some big money on a guy to bring in, and I think that Aaron Nola could really help the Giants do some damage. Yeah, I'm going to say Aaron Nola heads to St. Louis. I think that would de- definitely improve their rotation enough to have them compete for that playoff spot. I mean, we, they got there two years ago, but uh, they lost to the fight in Phils, of course. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, they are a pl- still a talented team and talented enough to get them to the playoffs. I mean, they have guys like Paul Goldschmidt, Wilson Contreras, uh, Tyler O'Neill, like a bunch of guys that are 
very competitive and a bunch of guys that can get them to the playoffs. And I think in addition to that rotation, along with Miles Michaelis being in there as well, could definitely have that one-two punch and could definitely propel them to a playoff spot. Yeah, and when I look at a guy like Hoskins, I think that he's going to end up with the, a team like the Mariners, a team that barely missed the playoffs, a team that's looking to compete. And while he's a streaky bat, I think that that's something that that lineup could use a little bit more power because they have a guy like Julio Rodriguez who is pretty consistent in that order. If you add somebody that has some streaky power pops throughout the lineup, I think that Reese Hoskins could do some damage with the Mariners. I'm going to say Reese Hoskins head over to Chicago, the Chicago Cubs. I think one of their main issues was they were lacking a true first baseman. I mean, they had guys like Trey Mancini and Eric Hosmer trying out for that first base spot. And I just don't think you can really survive with that, especially with how good the NL Central has become. I mean, with the Brewers and the Reds and all those teams. And I think they were just missing a guy who could hit 30 home runs, obviously streaky bat, not incredible defense by any means, but I think... Reese Hoskins would definitely be a huge upgrade at that first base spot and definitely could propel that offense to the level that they needed to get to to get in the postseason. And who should the Phillies target in free agency? Well, I think from a lineup perspective, you want to look at a guy like Teoscar Hernandez, who I think does what Nick Castellanos does, but could probably get him for a little cheaper. And I think he's a bit of a better defender. And I think that if you're looking to move on from Castellanos, because it seems as though the front office wants to make a change. They don't want to bring back the same lineup where they all went cold. I think that Teoscar Hernandez is a guy that you could bring in, and he does what Castellanos does on a similar playing field, and I think you could get him for a little less money. Yeah, I want to look at a guy like Cody Bellinger from the Chicago Cubs. I mean, he was terrific last year for them, hit 307. He can hit for power and for average. He's a very good defensive center fielder. He can play first base if you really need him to. He's just a very talented center fielder spot that could solidify that spot if Johan Rojas isn't ready to hit well in the major leagues yet. He'd be a great guy to put in there both defensively and offensively and definitely add some even more pop to this lineup. Yeah, and I think from a pitching perspective, you're, if you're going to lose Nola, you need somebody in that starting rotation. And I think that Brandon Woodruff could be that guy. Uh, I don't think that the Phillies can go out and get the, uh, the Japanese prospect. They have never had a Japanese prospect in their entire um, or career or lifetime as an organization. I don't think that that's going to start now. I think they're going to bring in a guy who's already solidified a solid MLB career in Brandon Woodruff who was hurt for a majority of last year's season. But I think that Brandon Woodruff, is all, he's already all right with being a number two option. He sat behind Corbin Burns. So I think that if he sits behind Zach Wheeler, that's a still a good number, a little one-two punch. Yeah, I think when I look at last year, I think one of the bigger issues, I mean, obviously it, it improved a little bit, but I would say I would definitely want to get and solidify that closer spot in the bullpen. Just uh, obviously when you look at Josh Hader, he has been electric in the bullpen for the San Diego Padres, a 1.28 ERA in 61 games played in 2023, 33 saves, which is awesome to see. That'll definitely solidify that closer role. He's a hard-throwing lefty, and he I just think he would perfectly solidify the closer role, get Craig Kimbrell out of there. I don't want to see him step on a Phillies mound anymore. I just don't understand how you want to bring in a guy like Josh Hader that any time that there is a right-handed batter in the box, he can't pitch to him. And the closer position is the most overrated position in baseball. We need a pitcher to get three outs and just save one run. I don't think that Josh Hader is worth paying the money, especially when he can only pitch the lefties. Uh, Brian, I just, don't, I just don't understand why we would waste so much money on a closer. It's, it's the most overrated position in baseball. It really is. You pitch every day to go out and get three outs. You're dumbfounded. You have nothing to say. But Josh Hader is really good. He, he is good. <laughs> I'm not saying he's not good. I'm just saying, like, you could send out one of the guys you already have to go out and get three outs. Not every save situation is a high leverage situation. Out of those 33 saves, how many were 1-1 games? How many? Probably not all of them. Right, the, the save number, like it looks great, it's 33 saves, but it's an overrated position. All you need to do is go out and get three outs. I mean, but who else would you throw out there besides Alvarado if Kimbrell's not going? Sir Anthony. Sir With Anthony. how he played last year? Sir Anthony has had experience in that role and has up and down seasons every year. When you look at Sir Anthony's career, he has a good year, bad year, good year, bad year. He had a bad year last year, expect for him to bounce back and go into the closer spot. It's really, and they can even close her by committee. Whoever's hot, you put them in this closer situation. You don't need to spend 
15 to 20 million dollars on Josh Hader. But I just overall I like I don't I haven't seen that much success from it. I think they should just get that closer spot they've needed. We'll have to agree to disagree, and it looks like we're going to have to move on. Shay's really bugging us up here. <laughs> I'm and, sorry, but I was very passionate. And that is we another were both very episode about. of That Philly John. Once again, I'm your host, Shay Wiley, joined by Jay Clark and Brian McLernan. Um, we will see you in two weeks. Happy Thanksgiving, and that's it. <laughs> yeah!